Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining um, our webinar um, today. Obviously, it's on um, the topic of limitation, um, part of the kind of Farrah series of um, webinars. For those of you that don't know me, my name's John Brown. Um, I'm obviously a barrister at Farrah's Building. I was called in 2005. Um, and I practice almost exclusively in the fields of personal injury and clinical negligence, um, acting for both, both claimants and defendants. And that is the um, target audience for um, this talk today. Um, I'll be starting. My colleague in chambers, Lauren Jones, um, will then take over for a second part. Um, and then I'll then um, finish with some further information uh, at the end. So, um, first thing I almost forgot, there's a question and answer um, function. So you should be able to find that and you can type in some questions um, and we'll look to answer those at the end of the um, webinar. Uh, the other thing to say um, is that everybody will be provided with a copy of the slides and indeed I'm informed a video of the recording that should land in your inboxes tomorrow. But as I say, you get a full copy of the slides. Um, when Lauren and I wrote this talk, uh, we realized that once we'd finished, there was quite a lot to cover. So I'm going to rattle through the uh, start of the talk, dealing with the first few slides, um, which is essentially the kind of basics to get us going on um, limitation. There we go. Right. Limitation, creature of statute. Um, in fact, I found out when researching for this talk, it can be traced back all the way through to 1623. Um, there's obviously good policy reasons for um, limitation being in existence to kind of protect defendants from having to deal with stale claims when documents or evidence uh, may well have disappeared some years after the um, uh, accident that lead to the cause of action. Um, we're obviously talking about the Limitation Act in 1980. And the first thing to realize is that um, limitation is no more than a defense. So um, even if a claim is outside limitation, of course, they can still bring a claim. And unless the defense is raised uh, by a defendant, um, then of course they can just continue with uh, that claim. The normal limitation periods for contracts and tort, uh, as I'm sure you all appreciate, is six years, but we're dealing with a special limitation period for personal injury claims. Um, and that's three years from um, the date of the cause of action, so essentially the injury, or uh, the date of knowledge um, of the person who is injured. Uh, as I'm sure you all appreciate as well. Um, if you're outside, if a claimant's outside the primary limitation period, then that can be disapplied by way of uh, section 33. Um, Lauren's gonna be dealing with um, the cause of action accruing and date of knowledge, and then I'll be touching upon um, section 33 and then dealing with some um, other self-contained matters. So, uh, Limitation Act section 11, uh, we can see here, we're talking about negligence, nuisance, or breach of duty. Uh, and that's breach of duty by way of contract or statute and consisting of or including damages in respect of personal injury. So the only things to take away from that really is we're talking about the three-year limitation period for negligence, nuisance, classic talks, talks of that name, um, but also breach contract statutory duty it's worth pointing out that trespass to the person, so assault and battery now, also falls within the three-year limitation period. Um, that case of Hall overruled, I think it was Stubbings and Webb, um, but that's um, clear on the law now. Um, and also the three-year limitation period applies to mixed claims because of course the wording of section 11 is where damages claimed consist of or include. Now if somebody's outside the three year limitation period or primary limitation period, it would always be open to them to abandon the PI element of the claim and then be left with a um, longer limitation period if they so choose. But as long as there is some PI, we're talking about three years. Now, um, first big takeaway, and this is a, a big takeaway, beware, there are certain specific types of, types of personal injury claims that fall outside of the Limitation Act. That's important because you don't necessarily, first of all, have a three year limitation period. Secondly, you will not be able to avail yourself as a claimant of any discretion under section 33. So you do not want to get that wrong. Um, here are some examples that I've um, set out there. Essentially, my rule of thumb is 
um, your sort of an antennae should start um, waving if we're dealing with any kind of international elements, a holiday claim, travel by air or by water, so sea or even inland, um, but also if we're talking about um, embarking or disembarking from boats or airports, these are all the sorts of things um, which means you need to take real care. Now, limitation periods in these sorts of uh, actions go far outside the scope of this talk, but you just need to, everybody needs to um, be aware of that. Other limitation periods under the um, Limitation Act, well, fatal accidents, um, if we've got time, I'll deal with that um, at the end, but you can see there um, some other sections of the Limitation Act where that specifically um, deals with these sorts of claims. And also for defendant practitioners, um, where there's a claim for contribution or indemnity, it's two year limitation period. Um, if that's dealt with a trial, um, then of course that's judgment on quantum, not just liability. Um, if it's by way of uh, settlement, then it's the, the date on which agreement was reached on the amount to be paid. And it's the date of agreement, not the date of uh, payment. There are some exceptions um, under the Limitation Act. Uh, the first is section 28. So this is um, persons under disability. Now this is specific. So in terms of the Limitation Act, what we're talking about is uh, someone that's a minor or somebody that lacks capacity. I'm sure you're all aware, um, limitation doesn't start running when somebody's a minor. Um, when they reach the age of majority, it's at that point the limitation clock starts ticking. And so there's three years from that date. So it expires once, they're, once they reach the age of 21. And in terms of capacity, if somebody never has capacity, if a claimant never has capacity, limitation will never start running. But when they regain capacity, the limitation clock will start ticking and it will continue ticking even if capacity is subsequently lost. So that's um, worth remembering. Um, but if there is a subsequent period of uh, disability, then that will specifically be taken into account um, if there's any application under section. 33. There's also an exception for uh, fraud, mistake and concealment. It's unlikely to come up in uh, PI claims, but the one I've focused on there is um, deliberate uh, concealment. There is some possibility that a, a defendant may deliberately conceal some kind of fact uh, in a PI claim. And there was a recent case of um, Canada Square there, um, case this year in the Court of Appeal that deals with deliberate concealment. That was in the context of um, PPI. Uh, you can see there, you don't need a freestanding duty to disclose and um, recklessness is sufficient for deliberate concealment. Uh, and then finally, before I hand over to uh, Lauren, uh, when is a claim issued brought? Well, CPR says court issues a claim um, on the date that's entered on the form by the courts so on the claim form. Um, but you only need to look at the practice direction um, to see that in fact, um, where a claim form is issued, but it was received in the court office at an earlier date, for the purposes of limitation, the claim is brought on that earlier date. So um, claimants within limitation, as long as the, um, the court office receives uh, the claim form. So of course, to determine whether a claim has been brought in time, you'll need to see the uh, notice of issue because that will specifically detail the date on which the um, uh, claim form was received. Uh, right, now I'll stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Lauren. Uh, Lauren, you're still on mute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lauren Jones. I'm a junior tenant at Farrah's Building, um, and I was called in 2017. Um, as John said, I'm going to be giving you a whistle stop tour of how to calculate limitation and um, when time starts to run. Um, starting with counting the days, then um, you can see there on the slides that um, the day um, when the cause of action accrues uh, doesn't start doesn't count. Um, and part days also don't count. And if limitation expires on a day when the court office isn't open, so a weekend or a bank holiday, then the end of the limitation period will be extended um, to the day after that. 
Um, and you can see those principles at work in the example at the bottom of the slide there. Um, if the claimant's injured at 2.30 p.m. on the 16th of September, um, the end of that day, the afternoon isn't counted. Limitation starts to run at the beginning of the 17th of September um, and expires at the end of the 16th of September 2023. That day is a Saturday. Um, so in this example, um, limitation would expire on uh, the Monday, which would be the next day when the court office would be open. Um, when does a cause of action accrue then? Um, well, a cause of action accrues when all of its constituent elements are present. Um, so for a personal injury claim based on negligence or breach of statutory duty, um, then as you all know, um, the four basic elements will be duty, breach of duty, causation and damage. Um, in a personal injury case where uh, the injury is instantaneous, so a broken bone or something like that, it will obviously be very easy to determine when damage occurred, but that's not always the case. Uh, and it's going to be difficult in some cases, such as um, disease cases. Um, and the leading case on um, this point uh, is the one up on the slide there, it's cartilage and e -jopling. Um the claimants in that case were steel dressers and they developed a um, respiratory disease called pneumoconiosis. Um, it's a, a slowly developing progressive disease where um, damage can be done to a person's lungs before um, they're even aware of it. Um, and the House of Lords in that case had to decide um, when the cause of action accrued. And as you can see on the slide, the House of Lords said a cause of action accrues on the date where damage, which is not merely trivial, um, occurs and the House of Lords said that the claimant's knowledge of the same is irrelevant. Um, at that time, the Limitation Act 1939 was in force and that um, version of the Limitation Act didn't include any provision for a situation where the claimant isn't even aware of their injuries uh, until the three year time period has passed. Um, so the House of Lords in that case were statute uh, bound to find that the claimants uh, claims had expired before they were even aware of their injuries and the House of Lords expressed um, expressed their regret in that case um, as to the injustice of the situation and hoped that um, the legislation would be um, altered. The legislation was altered and we now have um, section 11.4 of the Limitation Act and that provision as I'm sure you all know, um, provides that limitation will start to run from the date when the cause of action accrues or um, the claimant's date of knowledge, whichever is the later of the two. Um, so you can see on the slide there that the cause of action accrues um, when the final um, constituent element uh, damage, which is, more, which is not trivial, occurs. Um, and we're now going to talk about um, when date of knowledge um, might be. So first of all, what has the claimant got to know um, for them to have uh, knowledge? Well, section 14.1 of the Limitation Act is set out there and it says um, there are four things which the claimant needs to know. And the claimant has to know all of those four things um, for their date of knowledge to have um, occurred. The first is that the injury in question was significant. Second is that the injury was attributable um, in whole or in part to the act or omission that they're complaining about. Um, the third is the identity of the defendant. And the fourth um, is if they're saying that the act or omission was committed by somebody who isn't the defendant, um, then the identity of that person and the facts which support the action being brought against the defendant. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, there's a caveat which says that knowledge that any acts or omissions did or did not as a matter of law um, involve negligence, nuisance or breach of duty is irrelevant. And we'll come on to that in a bit more detail later. So what counts as knowledge? Um, the leading case on that point um, is Ministry of Defence and AB. Um, this was a decision which actually divided the Supreme Court. It was decided on a 4-3 majority. Um, it was a case about a number of ex-servicemen who had been exposed to ionising radiation. Um, and they said that that had caused them various health conditions, um, in most cases, cancer. 
Um, and uh, unusually, all nine of the test uh, cases, in all nine of the test cases, um, the claimants had believed that their injuries were caused by ionizing, ionizing radiation more than three years before they brought their claims. That's what they believed. But they didn't actually know that ionizing radiation was capable of causing their injuries until a report called the Roland Report um, was published after their claims had been brought. Um, so the question for the Supreme Court was whether a belief um, as to attributability is enough. Um, and if not just attributability, belief as to any of the facts required for knowledge, is that enough? And if so, what level of belief is required? Um, and does it have to be founded upon objective facts? Um, you can see what the Supreme Court said there on the slide. Um, the first point is that a person has acquired knowledge of a fact when they first come to reasonably believe in the truth of that fact, even if they're not aware of any evidence which supports their belief. So belief can be enough um, to constitute knowledge. The second point is that that belief needs to be held with sufficient confidence to justify embarking on the preliminaries to the issue of a writ, such as submitting a claim to the proposed de defendant, taking legal and other advice uh, and collecting evidence. So it can't just be um, a very vague belief. It does need to be strong enough at least um, to justify doing those things. Um, and thirdly, it's not automatically the case that a claimant will have knowledge when they first um, consult an expert or take legal advice. It was pointed out um, that actually experts can have more than one role in a case. Um, and the question of whether or not time starts to run when the claimant consults an expert um, is a question of fact in each case. Um, so that's uh, what, what amounts to knowledge. Uh, we'll now move on to the things that the claimant needs to know. So the first of those, as we've already seen, is that their injury was significant. And the definition of what is a significant injury um, is there. It's at section 14.2 of the Limitation Act. Um, and it says that the person whose knowledge is in question needs to reasonably have considered it sufficiently serious to justify his instituting proceedings for damages against a defendant who did not dispute liability and was able to satisfy a judgment. That's the definition. Um, the case of um, A and Hall said that when you're looking at um, whether an injury, um, whether a claimant ought to know that an injury is um, significant and what point, at what point, um, an objective test needs to be applied, um, an entirely impersonal standard. So the three questions which the court has to ask itself are, firstly, what knowledge did the claimant have um, about the injury they suffered, and that's obviously their actual knowledge. Um, secondly, what knowledge is to be imputed to the claimant about the injury they had, so their constructive knowledge, and we'll come on to that later. Um, and then thirdly, what would a reasonable person with that, would a reasonable person with that knowledge have considered the injury significant, um, according to the definition? Um, under section 14.2, which we've we've looked at, it's got to be sufficiently serious to justify um, his instituting proceedings. Um, I, I've included a case, uh, a quote from a case there, Summers and uh, the city and county of Cardiff, um, on what counts as a significant injury. Um, and that case is really summarising what was said, what's been said in um, various other authorities. Um, and that's that the case the question of whether an injury is significant is not a question of um, causation or, or the nature of the injury. It's about quantum. And um, as long as an injury is one which a court could properly um, award damages for, um, then it's likely to count as a significant injury, even if um, it's a minor injury. And um, there have been cases where um, claimants have been held not to have knowledge that their injuries were significant. Um, because they reasonably thought that their injuries were just temporary. Um, so, for example, you can see uh, Harding and People's Dispensary up there on the slide. Um, the claimant in that case thought for 18 months that the pain in her leg and back were just due to a temporary strain, and she wasn't held to, um, to have knowledge that her injuries were significant um, at that point. 
If there's more than one injury, time starts to run as soon as the claimant knows that at least one of the injuries um, is significant. And you can see um, the case there in relation to that. Uh, now we move on then to um, the second thing the claimant has to know, that the injury was attributable to the act or omission that they're complaining about. Um, and as I said earlier, um, Section 14.1 specifically states um, that they don't have to have knowledge that the act or omission they're complaining of as a matter of law um, involved negligence, uh, nuisance or breach of duty. And a good illustration of that is the case which you can see up on the slide there, Dobby and uh, Medway Health Authority. The claimant in that case went into hospital to have a lump removed from her breast. And uh, wrongly believing the lump to be cancerous, the surgeon removed it straight away without excising it for microscopic examination, which is what he should have done. Um, as a result of the mastectomy, the claimant, perhaps unsurprisingly, suffered from psychological injury. Um, and initially, she accepted what she was told by the nurse and the surgeon, which was that she was just lucky that the lump had, be, had turned out to be benign. Um, and the Court of Appeal found that time began to run straight after the operation. Um, and that was because the claimant knew from the outset that she had a significant injury and it had been caused by something done or not done by the surgeon. The Court of Appeal said it didn't matter that she didn't know until a much later date that actually what the surgeon did or didn't do was negligent because she knew um, what she was complaining about. Um, this case, um, Spargo and North Essex District Health Authority, is a good summary of um, what the claimant needs to know and when they will know um, in relation to attributability. Um, you can see the first point says that the knowledge required is um, a broad knowledge of the essence um, of the causally relevant act or omission. So the claimant doesn't have to know exactly um, the intricacies of the act or omission, but they do need to know the essence of what they're complaining about. Um, attributable in this context means capable of being attributed to, in the sense of it being a real possibility. So the claimant doesn't have to know that definitely um, their injuries were caused by the act or omission. They just need to know that um, their injuries are capable um, of being attributed to it. Um, and you can see there um, that a claimant has requisite knowledge when she knows enough to make it reasonable for her to begin to investigate whether or not she has a case against the defendant. The fourth point um, talks about some different um, examples of when the claimant might not have um, the requisite knowledge. And I'll leave you to read um, the three examples in your own time. You'll have the slides, as John said at the beginning, but. Um, the first one, I think, is quite interesting. Um, the claimant won't have the requisite knowledge if um, she knows the acts or omissions she should investigate, but actually um, she's barking up the wrong tree um, in terms of what she thinks she needs to be investigating. Um, an example of that is the case of Rowbottom and Royal Masonic Hospital. Um, that was a case where the claimant's claim was actually based upon um, a failure to administer antibiotics. He had a um, hip replacement um, and antibiotics ought to have been administered after the replacement. They weren't. Um, and so his hip became infected and ultimately he had to have his leg amputated. Um, initially, the claimant thought that the cause of his injury was um, the failure to install a drain on his hip. Um, and the Court of Appeal concluded um, that time didn't start to run in terms of uh, his date of knowledge until he received a medical report telling him that it wasn't the failure to install a drain. It was the failure to administer antibiotics. And that's because he, until that point, had been barking up the wrong tree. Um, just a little bit then on omissions, you might think it would be more difficult for a claimant to know um, that an omission, um, to know about attributability in relation to an omission, um, because they may not know that an omission has occurred, um, and that's probably right in some cases. Um, 
in a clinical negligence context, a claimant needs to know not just that um, some treatment didn't take place, um, but also that there was a missed opportunity um, because of the fact that treatment didn't take place. Um, and often that will be um, a matter of medical evidence um, and something that claimant wouldn't be expected to know um, on their own. An example of that is um, the case of Smith and West Lancashire Health Authority. Um, the claimant was diagnosed with an uncomplicated fracture of his ring finger. It was treated conservatively to begin with um, when actually it should have been um, urgently operated on. Um, he later did have surgery, but that surgery wasn't um, successful and he lost function in his hand. Um, the Court of Appeal in that case found that the claimant couldn't have known that there had been an admission, an omission, um, until he was advised of that um, later by a medical expert. I say all of that, but it's important um, to remember that those points must be balanced with the fact that a claimant will be treated by the court um, as uh, needing to have some curiosity um, in relation to their injuries. So just because it's more difficult for a claimant to know about um, an omission doesn't mean a claimant um, can always say, well, I, I couldn't possibly have known about that. Um, and we'll come on to um, curiosity and what role that has to play in just a minute. Um, the identity of the defendant, um, that's the third thing which the claimant needs to know. Um, this is unlikely to come up very often. Um, probably the most likely scenario is where there are group companies involved. And you can see um, there an example of a case um, involving group companies, Cressy and uh, E. Timmonson. That was an accident at work and the claimant was employed by the defendant um, but all of his payslips bore the name of a different but associated company. Um, and so there was some confusion as to the identity of the defendant, um, which I think actually was perpetuated by um, the defendant's insurers. And the Court of Appeal held that in a case of that sort, um, the date of knowledge can be postponed for as long as it reasonably takes to make and complete uh, the appropriate inquiries. Coming on then to constructive knowledge, um, I've talked a lot about what constitutes knowledge and um, what things the claimant needs to know. And um, this is the final point uh, which it's important to look at in relation to knowledge. Um, section 14.3, as you can see, says that um, a person's knowledge will include knowledge which he might reasonably have been expected to acquire from facts observable or ascertainable by him, or from facts ascertainable by him with help of medical or other expert legal advice, which it's reasonable for him to seek. Um, and there's a caveat to that at the bottom. Um, a person shall not be fixed under this subsection with knowledge of a fact ascertainable only with the help of expert advice, so long as he has taken all reasonable steps to obtain and where appropriate to act on that advice. And I'll explain that um, caveat in just a minute. Um, what that's essentially saying is that even if the claimant doesn't have actual knowledge, um, there will be some circumstances in which he'll be fixed um, with constructive knowledge. And section 14.3 is essentially um, a test for imputing knowledge to a claimant by reference to what that person ought to have done as opposed to what they did do. And um, the caveat at the bottom is essentially saying that if the claimant did uh, seek advice from an appropriate expert and they weren't um, told of a relevant fact by that expert, then that um, relevant fact won't be imputed to them as um, constructive knowledge. Is all of that decided according to an objective or a subjective test? Um, the case on this is Adams and Bracknell Forest Borough Council. Um, and this um, case dealt with a question which has proved pretty controversial over the years, which is um, when you're deciding what um, knowledge to impute to a claimant, um, do you take the claimant's personal characteristics into account or not? 
Um, and that case involved a claimant who was bringing a claim against his local education authority, um, saying that he ne they negligently failed to assess his ed educational needs um, because he was dyslexic um, and failed to provide him with help, which resulted in him being um, disadvantaged on the employment market. He hadn't mentioned um, the literacy problems which he had to anyone for a long time um, after the acts which he was complaining about. Um, and he only discovered that he was dyslexic because he mentioned um, some of his problems to somebody at a party who happened to be a psychologist and said, I think maybe you might be dyslexic. Um, and the important point of this case was that he hadn't, his evidence was that he hadn't mentioned um, his literacy problems because he wanted to hide them. Uh, he didn't want people to doubt his intelligence. So essentially he hadn't mentioned them as a result of his own personal characteristics. Um, and the House of Lords had to decide what the claimant reasonably um, should have done and whether his personal characteristics should be taken into account when deciding that. Um, you can see there the main points that are to be drawn from the case. Um, those are firstly that the test is uh, mainly an objective one. The second is that the claimant's personal characteristics should be ignored. Um, the question is whether a reasonable person in the claimant's situation, um, what, sorry, not whether, the question is what a reasonable person in the claimant's situation would have done. Um, and the reference there to the claimant's situation is simply to the claimant's injury. Um, so the court is looking at a person in the claimant's situation with their injury, but was at, without um, their personal characteristics. Um, the third point is if the claimant's injury is one which would hinder the claimant in taking advice, um, that should be taken into account. And um, fourthly and importantly, um, I was speaking about curiosity earlier, um, the court said that it has to be assumed that a reasonable person suffering from a serious injury will display some curiosity about why it happened. Um, and to finish off my uh, part of the talk, I'm just going to talk to you about two different cases which um, show the role that curiosity has to play um, when you're looking at constructive knowledge. Um, the first of those is Whitson and London Strategic Health Authority. That was a case in which the claimant suffered cerebral palsy um, as a result of brain damage at birth. Um, his mother was a midwife and had always had concerns about his birth, um, but she didn't tell him about those concerns until he was um, 30 years old um, because his condition had deteriorated. And the Court of Appeal acknowledged um, that a person who suffers a disability at birth is more likely to be accepting of their condition um, because they've never known anything different. But some curiosity was still expected. Um, the Court of Appeal concluded that a reasonable person in the claimant's situation would have asked his mother about his injuries when he was in his early 20s. Um, and he was fixed with constructive knowledge from that point. The next case then is Johnson and uh, the Ministry of Defence. That was a noise induced hearing loss case. Um, and the Court of Appeal in that case refined um, what Lord Hoffman said in Adams about curiosity. Um, Lady Justice Smith said that um, Lord Hoffman must have meant um, that a person suffering a serious injury will be curious about it unless a person in his or, situation, his or her situation would not be. Um, and the degree of curiosity to be expected of the reasonable person will depend on the seriousness of the condition and the way in which it manifested itself. And you can see that analysis at play um, based on Lady Justice Smith's decision um, in relation to that particular claimant. She um, reminded herself based upon her judicial experience that deafness presents itself in an, in an insidious way. Um, and she therefore allowed the claimant a year of thinking time um, between realizing that his injury was significant um, and the court finding it was reasonable for him to have sought expert advice. And um, just before I hand you back to John, I'm going to skip back two slides um, because there is one final point uh, to tell you about which I missed. 
and that's the interaction um, between section 33 um, and the curiosity that we've been talking about. Um, in the case of A and Hall, um, which I'm sure you all know about, it's a child sexual abuse case, um, Lord Carswell pointed out um, that the test in Adams um, saying that um, a claimant's personal characteristics won't be taken into account when looking at constructive knowledge. He said that that test was harsh on claimants. Um, and he said that therefore, um, a claimant's personal characteristics should form a part, um, and in some cases, a very significant part um, of the judge's determination in exercising their powers under section 33. And that concludes my part of the talk. It was a, a whistle stop tour. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm now going to pass you back to John, who's going to deal with section 33 and uh, some other matters. You can stop sharing your screen, Lauren. Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Right, there we are. Um, so that leads me very nicely on to um, considerations of section 33. So what happens if the claimants outside the primary limitation period, um, when can they avail themselves of that discretion? We can see here I'll put the wording of section 33. Um, the wording couldn't be broader in that it sent, the question is whether it appears to the court that it would be equitable to allow the action to proceed. Uh, what are you balancing? It's prejudice um, of the claimant against any prejudice the defendant would suffer. Then the court may direct that the primary limitation period won't apply. Um, in fact, it looks like it's a kind of true discretion where it says the court may direct. Um, but in truth, if a court determines that it's equitable to um, disapply primary limitation, then it, it will always um, so direct. Here's the... Um, it's further wording of section 33, subsection three. Um, the court has regard to all of the circumstances of the case. So this isn't a closed list, but these are just some factors that are set up in particular. Um, I mean, they are some sort of obvious things that the court will take into account. One can see their kind of length of and reasons for delay, um, the effect that the delay has had on the cogency of the evidence um, on which the parties want to rely. Um, conduct of the defendant, duration of any disability of the claimant after the accrual of the cause of action. And you recall I made reference to that um, when we're looking about somebody um, who regained capacity then loses capacity, um, the extent to which the claimant acted promptly, etc. cetera. Um, but in fact, the first port of call when um, considering a section 33 application, and that's, um, it doesn't matter what side of a, an application you're on, is this case of Greater Manchester Police and Carroll. Um, it is now the leading authority on the court's approach to section 33. Um, and uh, if you're dealing with that issue, go to this case and jump straight to uh, paragraph 42, not saying that the rest of it isn't worth a read, um, but it's at paragraph 42 that the um, general principles are set out in a kind of useful summary form. There are 13 general principles. And as I say on the slide, I would encourage at least reading that section in full. But what I'm going to do is look at four of the um, principles that we can take from uh, that case. The first of which is the, um, the fact it's a balance of prejudice uh, test. Burden is on the claimant, so it's for the claimant to show that the prejudice suffered would outweigh the prejudice to the defendant. Um, and makes clear, and you can see the, the wording there on the slide, um, refusal to exercise the discretion will always cause prejudice to the um, claimant. It's just a question of, um, as I say, whether the, that prejudice outweighs the prejudice to a defendant. Um, but this is of principal importance, which is um, what effect has the delay had on the evidence that's available and that the evidence um, that particularly the defendant is able or is likely to call? So, as we know, balance of prejudice test, the burden is on the claimant um, to make out their prejudice. But the defendant has an evidential burden um, of showing that the evidence adduced or likely to be adduced um, is or is likely to be less cogent because of the delay. Um, so that evidential burden is on a defendant. 
And we can see there that the prospects of a fair trial are um, important. Very often, in fact, it's the, um, it's the area of principal importance when a court considers um, Section 33 uh, application. Um, and that's because uh, limitation is there for a good reason, and that's to protect defendants from the injustice of having to fight stale claims. And that's particularly where witnesses are no longer available or documentary evidence um, is no longer available. So um, in looking at all of that, one then considers the prejudice suffered by a defendant. So if we've got documents lost or destroyed, well, the timing is uh, obviously of principal importance. Um, if those documents are no longer available only because of the delay, so had the action been brought in time, they would still be there, uh, then obviously that weighs heavily in favor of a defendant. But if the documents would have been let, lost in any event um, prior to the expiry of limitation, then in fact, the delay hasn't had any impact on the defendant's ability um, to defend. So um, if they're, from a defense perspective, if there aren't documents anymore, um, the court will expect, and there have been issues in, in cases um, on this point, the court will expect some evidence of um, when they were lost or um, when they were likely to have been lost, um, and evidence about whether they would have been uh, available had the action been brought in time. Um, but where records are still available and a case is unlikely to turn on recollection, then that's going to be important uh, because you've still got some um, sort of contemporaneous sources of evidence there. And that's, that can be a particular feature of some uh, clinical negligence claims. And that leads me on to the sort of death of a doctor cases. So the first is uh, Moss's estate. Um, that's a case where in fact the defendant doctor was uh, entirely unaware of proceedings uh, before his death, um, had no opportunity of providing instructions. I think in fact he was already in hospital at the time that proceedings were served. Um, claim was issued less than a year out of time. Um, and the court said, realistically, that doctor could have given instructions if the claim had been issued of time, uh, but would never uh, have lived to attend the trial. Court accepted in that case. Well, the death of the defendant doctor does cause prejudice, and it had had a detrimental effect on the cogency of the evidence. But that isn't determinative um, of the Section 33 issue. And what was held, and this is a case where um, the issue was adequacy of consent, court held that uh, a fair trial was still possible on the basis of the available evidence. The record still existed, um, and it's unlikely, although not impossible, that the doctor in fact would have had any detailed recollection of dealing with the claimant um, in any event, and therefore the doctor's recollection would have added very little, if anything, uh, to the records. One of the things that was pointed out in that case, and I think it's important to those practicing in um, clin neg where we're dealing with um, an application under uh, section 33 and we're looking at, at records and so on, particularly where there's issues of um, uh, consent, uh, the court made reference to the fact that medical professionals are under a duty to keep accurate clinical notes. And so it's always going to be difficult for a doctor to allege that they provided significantly more information than in fact um, was recorded in the records in any event. Uh, and the next case, and this is a very recent case um, last year of Azam and University Hospital Birmingham. This was a case where the surgeon had died after the expiry of the primary limitation period, but the claim was allowed um, to proceed 18 years out of time. Two issues in this case. The first was the failure to obtain properly informed consent. In fact, the court didn't allow that case to proceed. I mean, you can compare that to, to Mossel because that's um, some of the issues in that case. Uh, but the court did allow the um, allegation that the surgery was performed negligently um, to proceed. And the court held that there wasn't significant prejudice to the defendant trust, despite um, the surgeon uh, having passed away and them not being able to call live evidence from him. And again, one of the points is, well, even if the claim had been brought in time, it's unlikely that the surgeon would have had any particular memory of the um, operation. I think we can all understand um, what the court was thinking there. But importantly, the evidence of what the court found was that the evidence of how well the operation had been performed remained the appearance of the claimant's chest. This was an operation um, to the claimant's chest. Um, and the claimant's experts had uh, examined the claimant's uh, reviewed 
um, as I say, reviewed him and uh, suggested that the defendant's expert could do just the same. Now, very importantly in this case, um, were the comments on the evidence that would be required under a, a Section 33 application, because the judge was rather critical um, of the defendant trust in these circumstances, because essentially what they were saying was, well, the surgeons passed away. This is the epitome of prejudice. Um, what could be, what could um, cause us more prejudice than our surgeon um, having passed away? But in fact, they hadn't called any evidence to make out um, that prejudice has made essentially a bare assertion um, at the limitation trial. The trust hadn't called any expert evidence itself um, to say uh, what additional assistance the deceased surgeon could have provided to the trust um, expert. And the court found that in fact the trust had just failed to establish its case on prejudice flowing from the death of the surgeon um, by evidence because it was simply a, a mere assertion. And I think that's the um, kind of practice point to take away from that, which is um, it's all very well just looking at the circumstances and saying what we call prejudice. But you've got to consider, I think, the evidential position and call evidence um, to make good that point. Next issue is the reason for the delay. Well, um, that can be relevant, depends whether it's excusable uh, or not. And you will see there, bullet points of the considerations that the court will um, look at. Um, it's gonna look at the length of the delay first, uh, and then of course the subjective reasons uh, and whether that delay is excusable. Generally as a rule, um, the longer the delay, the more uh, likely of course is to refuse um, to um, uh, apply the discretion under section 33. Of course, it will always be um, the judgment for the court in each individual case. But just by way of a couple of examples, um, we've got here the first case, HMG3. This is a claim brought by a widow um, after her husband passed away, having been exposed to asbestos. And the judge found essentially in human terms, the delay was entirely understandable. Given the um, deceased increasingly poor health, the, the um, delay was justified given what they had to cope with and given that they were concentrating primarily um, on the health of the deceased and not on any potential litigation. The next case I'll put in there by way of example uh, is uh, Gregory and H.J. Haynes. There, there was a five year period of delay. Um, the court held wasn't um, culpable. Uh, during that time, no insurer could be identified on the employer's liability tracing office database. Um, the court held that nothing further, there's nothing further the claimant could have realistically done. In fact, in that case, um, the claimant solicitors in bringing a, uh, working for another claimant, um, discovered a, an insurer. And then there's questions of um, proportionality. A bit of a watchword in today's litigation, but you'll see the sorts of things that the court will um, uh, be minded to take into account um, when it exercises its discretion. You're looking at ultimate prospects of success. Um, the value of the claim in financial terms as against any legal costs, uh, whether the claimant has a clear case against uh, their own solicitor, and the extended degree of damage to the claimant's health. I mean, it seems to me that gets pretty close to sort of proportionality when you're considering um, the value of the claim in financial terms, but I suppose not necessarily. Um, but as I say, these are the kind of proportionality considerations. And so one of the things you see sometimes in the case law, for example, can be in um, noise induced hearing loss claims because very often they're not the most valuable uh, and sometimes essentially the court finds well we're not we're not um, going to exercise our discretion under section 33 because it's just not proportionate in this value of claim we're we doing on time so um right procedural issues uh, as i said at the start um it's an issue for the defendant to plead limitation they must do so if they want to take it um, if they don't it's not an issue in proceedings um, if it's raised in the defence, then it's open to the, or should I say what a, a claimant should always do is plead any factual assertions in a reply. In fact, um, if it's obvious that there's going to be some issues with, for example, date of knowledge, I would always advise pleading that date of knowledge in the particulars of claim in any event. Um, particularly if it's obvious the point's going to be taken, it may well um, have been kind of raised in pre-action correspondence by a defendant. Um, and in the reply, the claimant can then assert reliance on um, section 33. And at that stage, limitation is then properly pleaded. It's an issue in the proceedings. Um, 
one of the things that sometimes happens is there's um, criticism of a claimant for not making a, a separate standalone Section 33 application. Um, but Court of Appeal made clear in the case of um, Ripses and McKeown that it doesn't need to be a separate standalone application. It can simply be raised uh, in a reply. It has to be raised. So if it's not in the reply, you would need to make an application. But essentially, it needs to be clear in writing that it's an issue between the parties. At that stage, a kind of case management um, stage, the court has to decide how it's going to deal with the issue. Um, and the question is always, are we going to wrap limitation up in a trial or is it going to be dealt with as a preliminary issue? Um, is there going to be a separate limitation trial? There are pros and cons to this, depending on whether you're acting for a claimant or a defendant. And it does always depend on um, the particular issues in the case and the strength of those particular issues. Um, it's been said, and it makes sense, often the uh, substantive issues are so bound up with um, issues of limitation that it wouldn't be appropriate to separate them, particularly where there are contentious issues of fact, um, exactly what the claimant knew and when, and that would require live evidence, cross-examination, um, maybe cross-examination from the defendant's witnesses about what was available, documents, all these sorts of things that may go to um, not only breach, but also the prejudice that they have in defending the case. So if it's so bound up there, you're gonna need a lot of live evidence across examination. It's probably um, not the right decision to have it um, separated out. But for a defendant, very often it's um, to your advantage to try and seek limitation to be dealt with as a preliminary issue, particularly where um, there's a strong case on limitation for a defendant. You can try and limit your cost burden, particularly in these days of quarks. And if we're talking about fast track cases, then um, there is a, I mean, Lord Justice Jackson was pretty critical of this, but there is a, um, particularly for kind of low level employers liability, I'm thinking kind of noise induced hearing loss, that sort of thing. Certain areas of the country, it tends to be a given that there will be a separate limitation trial. Um, that was discouraged by Lord Justice Jackson, essentially um, on the basis that it, it's disproportionate in low value or fast track claims to have um, a separate limitation um, and then substantive trial. Um, fatal accidents. Um, I'll deal with this very briefly. It's sort of a standalone issue. Um, where we're dealing with the deceased estate, well, it's three years from date of death or date of knowledge of the personal representative. Um, but uh, that claim will be time barred if the deceased died after the expiration of their own limitation period. Um, so more than three years after injury or knowledge. Um, but the personal representative can still apply for um, the exercise of the court's discretion under Section 33. Um, if it's a um, claim under the Fatal Accidents Act, so claim for a dependent, um, it's three years from date of death uh, or date of knowledge of the dependent, but only if a claim could still be maintained by the injured person at the time of their death. So that means that they were with it either with, still within their own limitation period, so not three years after date of injury or knowledge. So this is somebody that's injured and then injured and then kind of languishes in hospital for an extended period before they uh, pass away. So if they were still within their own limitation period and they hadn't settled their claim, um, section twelve makes clear that no account can be taken of the possibility of a discretion under section thirty three. Slightly confusing because when you look at section 33, there is reference to the disapplication of um, section 12, subsection 1. Um, it's not a kind of clear case on this, but I think the it'd be safe to um, take the view that um, if the deceased would have been, uh, if they couldn't maintain a claim at the date of their death, then any dependent will be time barred and there's not much they can do about that. Um, but as long as um, they were within uh, at the time of their own limitation period, then any dependents, if they're outside their own limitation period, they can rely on um, section 33. Uh, it's worth noting that limitation will be considered uh, or applied to each dependent separately. Um, so children of various ages and a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a widowed spouse. But one of the things to take into account there, of course, is um, you've still got disability that applies the exception. So where you've got child dependents, um, they will still be able to bring their claim. Limitation doesn't start ticking for them until 
um, three years after they uh, obtain the age of majority. And if you've got child claimants that can still bring their claim because they're still within time, if you've got an adult dependent that will be outside of time, um, it's going to be likely that the court's going to exercise their Section 33 discretion because the defendant's going to be facing a dependency claim um, in any event. So one thing to think about is um, moratorium or standstill agreements. There are two possible types of agreements and it's very important that when you're um, engaging in one of these, you know um, which one you're agreeing to. Uh, standstill agreements can be very useful for both claimants and defendants um, where you've got some further investigations, it's particularly in complicated cases, uh, more common in clinic cases, uh, to allow parties to get some further expert evidence, um, to further investigate the claim, potentially to comply with any uh, pre-action protocol. So it can be in all parties' interest to agree to these standstill agreements, uh, but you need to be very careful. Um, you really, you need to do it for both sides, clearly and in writing, so everybody knows what they're agreeing to. And you need to know whether you're agreeing to suspend limitation or whether you're agreeing to extend it. Because if you're suspending it, you're simply freezing it over that period. So limitation will resume at the end of the date of that agreement. Um, if you're extending it, then obviously um, limitation will expire at the end of that uh, extension. And there are cases where parties have misunderstood uh, what they're agree agreeing to. And um, one can see how that can cause real problems. Where you're um, making a sort of written agreement, usual contractual principles apply. Um, so you've got to be very careful about the document. It's going to be interpreted as a whole and so on. Use clear language. So practice points for a, for a claimant. Do not assume that limitation is going to be extended by a defendant, even where negotiations are ongoing. Um, it's been said time and again, um, you get to the end of limitation uh, at your peril. So don't take any risks with that. Um, obtain clear express written agreements. Otherwise, you're going to be forced to rely on estoppel, which is very difficult to prove. Um, and as I say, standstill agreements are very useful, but consider um, your alternative, which is um, issuing and then asking the court to stay proceedings. Um, and for defendants, um, you can agree to them, even if you may want to have accrued a limitation defense already, but be very careful about the wording you um, agree to, because you need to ensure that you don't waive any already accrued limitation defense. And that is a mistake that has been made in the past. So don't use wording such as limitation is not an issue because um, you could be deemed to have waived any, as I say, accrued limitation defense at that stage and make clear in any agreement that you're reserving all rights in respect of limitation um, as to any period that's already elapsed prior to the agreement um, and make that uh, entirely clear. Uh, we're almost at an hour. And the final thing I wanted to say is um, case law has changed. What a claimant can do is if they are, um, they bring a claim in time but fail to serve proceedings, despite the strict rules on service, a claimant can in fact um, seek to rely on Section 33 discretion when bringing a second action um, out of time. And I've uh, referenced um, a few cases there. Right, um, that brings us to the end of the um, hour. Let me stop sharing my screen, uh, stop share there, and let's see if we have any questions. We've got one question that I already had a quick look at. Um, I'm not sure if any, everybody can see that, um, so I'll read it out. The question is, any steer on limitation in relation to legal costs? It seems a minefield having considered it on a few matters, thanks. Um, that's from Phil. Phil, I'm not entirely sure on what circumstances you're referring to. So I think it's going to be difficult um, to answer that question. I suppose it's going to depend on, um, I mean, under the CPR, if you're talking detailed assessment, it's a three month limitation period, either from settlement or the date you got judgment for costs. Maybe it's an issue with the other side, pre-action or something like that. But um, if there's something um, that you want to steer on or, or, or a particular question you've got, then feel free to um, send either myself or Lauren um, an email in chambers directly to us or, or via the clerks, we'd be happy to help, but I'm not entirely sure um, the circumstances that you're particularly asking about. Um, but other than that, Lauren, I can't see any other questions. Can you? You're, you're muted. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, apologies. No? <laughs> um, no, I can only see that one question as well. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, um, that just leaves us to say thank you very much, everybody, for attending. We hope that was useful. There was a lot to go through, so um, we sort of rattled through it. But as I say, um, you will get the slides sent to you. And if there is any particular question that maybe you didn't want to ask here and you want to ask offline, um, we've got an open door policy. So please feel free to um, email either Lauren or myself. And as I say, direct or via the clocks, and we'd be happy to help. Um, other than that, um, it's just to say uh, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Cheerio. Bye-bye.